All right, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here, and me and my friend ChatGPT have put together a great sermon for you this morning. You're going to love it. Uh, now, I have to tell you, are really lucky here in Brentwood. I don't get to come all the time, but week by week, you have a Bible teacher named Pastor Ray, and you are in very good hands here. Can we applaud our friend Pastor Ray? Pastor Ray is my friend. He is a pastor to me in some ways. I learned so much from him, and he's not only is he the same man off the stage that he is on the stage, I think he's in some ways a better man, which is not to say he's a bad man on the stage, but you know what I'm saying. He's a good guy. He's the real deal, and um, I'm really thankful he's letting me pinch hit this morning, and uh, yeah, it's, he's a special person. So this last six weeks, as Ray mentioned, we've been in this series called Explore God, and uh, we've been looking at big questions that people have about life and God, whether or not you're a Christian or religious, questions that a lot of people have. So let's review where we've been in the past six weeks. In week one, we asked the question, is there purpose in life? Are we doing, what are we doing here? Are we just floating along or is there meaning? Secondly, big question, week two, is there a God? Why should I think there's a God? So we talked about that week three, why is there evil and injustice? Because if there is a God, he must be bad at running the world. <laughs> like, how do we understand that whole part? Week four, does Christianity crush diversity? You hear that idea sometimes. It's bad news for diversity. Is that true? We talked about that. Week five, is the Bible trustworthy? Why should I construct my life around this book? Do I trust it? Why? Week six, is Jesus really God? Who is, this, who is Jesus? And then today, week seven, final week, we're going to ask this question. Can I have a friendship with God? And this whole series has been designed to make space for some honest conversations with people who are skeptical, uh, who are on the fence about the whole Jesus, God thing. And maybe that's you. And if you're here, welcome. You're in a, in a place where you're loved and not judged. Uh, one of the things that's been cool about this series is we're not doing it by ourselves. We've been doing it together with 150 plus other churches in the whole Bay Area. It's been this big Christian unity effort, and that is so cool when Christians work together. It makes Jesus happy. And also, you know what? Unity is our superpower. When we, uh, the larger family of God, love each other and work together, we can do so much. This, this church, the Bay Church, has a regional vision to bring the, the love of Jesus, the community healing presence of Jesus throughout the Bay Church or throughout the Bay Area. But we deceive ourselves if we think we're the only ones who care about this. That's not true. There's a lot of good people who love God in our region. And so we're trying to work together. The Bay Church is just a tiny slice of the church in the Bay. Does that make sense? The church in the bay is this big, beautiful thing, and there's no upper limit to what we can accomplish together if we don't give a rip who gets the credit, because Jesus gets the credit. Yes. So we've been, we're, we've been in this big collective series. Today we're landing the plane, and as I mentioned, the question we're going to try to answer is, can I have friendship with God? What does that even mean? And so let's start out with a basic observation, which is this, that knowing about God is a very different thing than knowing God. Knowing about God is not the same thing, related, but not the same thing as knowing about God. Look, here's a door. If you come to my house and knock on my door and you only know about me, you know what that makes you? A stalker, bro. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't be a stalker. But if you come to my house and knock on my door and you know me, you know what that makes you? That makes you my friend. That's cool. So what does it mean to be friends with God? It means to go beyond knowing about him with impersonal knowledge. But by the way, that kind of knowing about, is very important. We've spent the last many weeks laying out some like basics about what Christians believe. It's vital. It's just not the end, you know? It's um, head knowledge is the kind of stuff you get online, you read somebody's profile, you read the blurb, where they live, what they do, do they go to school, who's their family, are they in a relationship, all that stuff. That's like good data. That's knowledge about someone. But when you actually meet someone face to face, you look in their eyes, you shake their hands, you talk to them, now your knowledge has gone into a whole new 
dimension, right? right? Now you know them. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. There's a, uh, a tradition in some of the ancient churches of the East, like the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, the Egyptian Coptic Church, the Syrian Church, and so forth. There's a tradition that only a very, very small number of people get the title of being a theologian. Here in the West, in the Western Church, like if you go to the proper courses and pass the proper exams, congratulations, you're now a theologian. But not so in the East. A theologian isn't somebody who just knows how to talk about God. A theologian, rather, is someone who actually knows God. And so the tradition is, you know, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of those four writers, only one of them was a real th theologian. That's John. Because there's something profound and deep in the way that he knew Jesus. And that is a, a truth that we're in danger of distorting in our culture today. Some years ago, there was a trend in sort of hipster Christianity to signal your virtue with phrases like, Jesus is my homeboy. You know, you ever seen this? Like, me and Mr. JC, like, we're tight like this. Like, we're just, you know, me and Jesus, it's cool. It's like, okay, homie, um, the only problem with that sort of buddy-buddy, cash, camaraderie with God uh, is that it's nowhere in the Bible. <laughs> so think with me for a second about some of the epic moments of meeting God in the Bible and the human reactions that ensued. In Exodus chapter 3, a man named Moses, whose life is a total disaster, meets God, and God has a plan for him, and he says, yeah, find someone else. I'm unavailable. Like, I don't want to do it. Um, Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah chapter 6, God calls him and has a task for him. He says, ah, I'm disqualified. I can't possibly. Next, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, God, God meets this young man, calls him, and he says, I can't do it. Like, I'm, I'm totally not prepared for this. Think about Peter in Luke chapter 5. Jesus approaches him. And Peter says, get away from me, Lord. You have no idea who you're dealing with here. I'm a total wreck. Think about John in the book of Revelation. He sees the risen Jesus, and he falls on his face like he's dead. What's the common denominator here? D Jesus is your homeboy? No. A sense of awe? a sense of unworthiness in the presence of God. So a liability that we have when we think about having a friendship with God is we often have no idea what that little word God means. We often underestimate it radically. God does not mean homeboy or your spiritual boyfriend or anything of that sort. God is the Holy One, the Almighty, all good Lord of being. And so any friendship that we have with him does not mean it's between equals. Friendships don't necessarily have to be between equals. If they did, then humans have been lying to themselves for centuries about dogs being man's best friend. <laughs> dogs are great friends. I love dogs. Are they equals with humans? No. Is there genuine mutual affection and love? Actually, yes. Our friendship with God is kind of like that. I'm not calling you dogs. All right, dog? But I'm just saying, it's not between equals. This reminds me of a scene in a, a famous story by C.S. Lewis called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Maybe you've seen the movie, read the book. Anyways, um, towards the end, two of the characters, Lucy and Susan, get to meet this, the God figure in the story. He's this wild lion named Aslan. And uh, this is what happens. Let me read it to you. Oh, said Susan, I, I thought Aslan was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. You know, in my own journey to God as an adult, one of the hang-ups for me was this assumption that uh, to become a Christian was to become like a good, proper little boy. You know, just, but I didn't want to become a good little boy. I wanted to be a wild man. I didn't want to, like, put on a little bow tie and comb my hair. I wanted to put on Braveheart paint 
and like climb mountains and slay dragons. That's what I wanted to do. And what helped me here, what shifted my assumptions was actually exposure to church history. Turns out that in the history of Christianity, not only is the king wild and untamable, but there have been many wild daughters and sons in the church. In fact, for me, the craziest, most intensely daring, visionary politicians, artists, philosophers, activists, leaders that I know of in history were sons and daughters of the church. So becoming a Christian is not like settling down to be a good little boy or girl. It's actually to let loose the true wild music inside of you. And yet there's a wrinkle here because the music doesn't fully come from inside of us. It actually comes from without, outside of us. We don't achieve it within. We receive it from without. It's the music of heaven. And we learn to hear it. We learn that frequency when we spend time in God's presence. When we open a door and let him into the innermost chamber of our imagination, of our dreams, of our affections. Listen to what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus is speaking. He says, behold, I stand at the door. I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, if anybody's home, well, I'll, I'll come in to him and eat with him and he with me. This is an amazing promise. Who do you share meals with? Do you share re meals regularly with your banker, with your trainer, with your representative in Sacramento and D.C.? Do you hang out with them and eat meals together? Probably not. Yeah. Who eats meals together? Family, Family friends. That's who eats meals together. So think about this. Although Jesus, if we really saw who he really is for all his devastating holiness and beauty, we'd fall dead. Even though that same Jesus is knocking on the door and saying, hey, let's be friends. Let's have a meal together. So the answer to our question today, can I have friendship with God is yes, you can. And shock, we're in church. What am I supposed to say? No, you can't have friendship with God. Sorry, uh, his calendar's full. You'll have to come back later. No, you can have friendship with God, but I want to spend a few minutes thinking about what that really means. What does that mean? And let's, we got to start by understanding why. Why would God want to have a friendship with each one of us? It's a wild claim. I mean, let's say you're an employer at a large company, okay? You've got like 800 employees under you. And um, do you really think it'd be reasonable to have a deep connection with each one of your 800 employees? Probably not. Yeah, you'd probably get nothing done. That's why you have a few direct reports and you delegate the rest. But the claim of Christianity is way more astonishing than that. There's some 8 billion people in the world today and God both wants to and can have a personal deep connection with each of these 8 billion souls. How does that how does that even work? And I know all the introverts in the room, you're already, you're, that's deeply overwhelming. You're like, my max friend count is eight, and seven of them are dead authors. So it's a really good that you're not God. Let's just say that. Um, why would God want to have a relationship with all of his creatures? Here's what we need to know. The reason God desires a relationship with each of his human creatures is that God's very nature is relational. He is a trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. The inner life of God is love, an eternal, reciprocal, creative, overflowing reality of love. And it's not selfish. It's not barring others out. God's love constantly, restlessly reaches out to his beloved creation to have the same sort of connection with them. It's a kind of connection that in a real sense is like an ecstasy in the technical meaning of the word. Ecstasy, ek meaning outside of and stasis meaning standing. An ecstasy is when we stand outside of ourselves and when we love another person, when we love God, we are in a sense standing outside ourselves, experiencing an ecstasy. And this is what God does 
in Jesus and the Spirit that go out into the world. The Trinitarian God doesn't just sit and soak in his own little loving community like a private jacuzzi and just say, okay, no one can come out. No, he relentlessly pours himself out, ecstatically gives himself away, and puts in motion then the eternal truth that Jesus taught us, both by speech and by example, that when you live for others, when you empty yourself for others, that's when you actually find yourself. That's when you actually fulfills your, your, fulfill your destiny. So what this means is that for us to have a relationship with God isn't just about like, oh, my private devo time and like this when I sip coffee and like feel tingles. No, this is when you plug your life into the, the living, vibrant flow behind everything the God who is the creator and sustainer of everything. And just as the, the universe that God has made is populated, right, with stars and planets and creations of endless variety, just so our connection with God is not a prefabricated, cookie-cutter sort of thing. It actually has uniqueness to each one of us. Like, yeah, there's some basics. There's some fundamental ways God's presence is available to all humans through the scripture, through prayer, through a church family, other people who are trying to walk in obedience to Jesus, that's basic. But at a more granular level, this also is true, that a personal relationship with God, you hear that phrase a lot in church, personal relationship with God. It also means a personalized relationship with God. There's going to be things that you connect with God with that I don't, because it's you, man, and it's not me. There's things I'm going to connect with God that you don't, because you're you, and I'm like, that's fine. That's how it should be. It's personal and therefore personalized. On our staff recently, we were talking about like how to grow in your faith, how to have spiritual disciplines, and somebody said, oh, you know what's a great idea? For a month, only listen to Christian music, only k for a whole month. At which point, someone else on our staff who shall remain nameless said, if I only listen to k for a whole month, I think I'd be clinically depressed. I think I'd probably jump off something very tall. And, and, and that just goes to show you that God connects with different people in different ways. And that's fine. Jesus tailor makes his approach to people. We see this in the Bible. In the Gospel of John, for example, Jesus is interacting at all sorts of echelons of society. Rich, poor, Greek, Hebrew, male, female, urban, rural. Uh, educated, simple. He's, he's, he's traversing all these different parts of society. And in each encounter, there's something unique about his touch, about his approach. Listen to how the New Testament scholar Richard Bauckham describes this. He says that these dialogues that Jesus has with people, they're never repetitive. Each has its own theme. In most cases, the dialogue itself is a journey for Jesus' interlocutor, his conversation partner. These individuals end it, the conversation, in a different place from where they began it. Their lives are significantly changed. Each character has a unique story. It's not only, as has often been noticed, that they respond differently to Jesus, but that Jesus deals with each of them differently according to their individual circumstances. He does not deal with them according to some standard formula. but rather he engages the particular point in their lives at which he encounters them. Martha, mourning for her brother. Peter, in his awareness of having failed. With Nicodemus, he starts quite bluntly with the point that this religious expert doesn't understand and especially needs to understand. You know that's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That comes in a conversation Jesus is having with this religious scholar named Nicodemus. So, Wrap summing up, this diversity of circumstance encourages hearers or readers, i.e. us, we're reading the Bible, to expect Jesus to meet them and direct them in the particularity of their individual lives and circumstances. And as just one guy, this has been very true for me. There's ways that I connect with God that feel very unique to me. Maybe you share them, but I'll just share a couple with you. Uh, For me, being out in nature is always a, a real center point for me. Something about walking in the woods, 
uh, makes me just feel alive, makes my ears feel open. You know, the Bible talks about Jesus walking in the trees of Eden, and uh, sometimes I think he still does. Like, I just, I, for me, it works. Uh, or for me, another one is I love to go to museums, and um, I don't join the little, the group that goes around with the docent and they give, no, I put in my own ed- headphones and listen to music and just kind of get lost in the beauty of whether it's science or history or arts or what, and I feel like I'm connecting with the great artist of all, the great engineer behind everything. It's what just works for me. If this all sounds like babble to you, well, it is my personal relationship with God, all right? (laughs) Another way for me that I connect with God is actually through time with wise mentors. That for me, this is a man, uh, his name is Doug Clay. He's the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, and I've only met him a couple times, but each time he's had something to say that has been like, boom, on point and has enriched my relationship with God. You know, when we hang out with people who spent a lot more years with Jesus than we have, something of the aroma of Jesus kind of rubs off on us, and that's a good thing, having people who are wise in your life. So for me, these are a few things that work. But another aspect of a friendship with God, and you got to talk about this, is that it always involves discipline and some dimension of personal deconstruction, (laughs) some dimension of unraveling. But it's done in love because it's done with a purpose. It's done for the sake of a mission. Let me give you another uh, little excerpt from a C.S. Lewis story. This one's uh, called the, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. You ever heard of this one? Don Treader is the name of a boat. These people are on a boat, and they're on a long journey on a boat, okay? And the conversation I'm going to read is between two boys, Edmund and Eustace. And Eustace is such a punk, he's such a brat, that he's been turned into a dragon. And he's in this conversation, he's talking about when he's a dragon, and he encounters a lion. So let your imagination go there, okay? I know, this is like fantasy literature, but just go there. Eustace is talking. He's So, yeah, here we go. This is what he says. Then the lion said to me, but I don't know if it spoke, you will have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now, so I just lay flat down on my back and let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, It hurt worse than anything I'd ever felt. Then he caught hold of me. I didn't like that much, for I was very tender underneath now that I had no skin on, and he threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious, and as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone in my arm, and then I saw why. I'd turned into a boy again. This process of pain purifies him, makes him, restores him to who he's meant to be. Edmund said, I think you've seen Aslan. Aslan, said Eustace. I've heard that name mentioned several times since we joined the Don Treader. And I felt, I don't know what, I hated it. I hated that name Aslan. But I was hating everything then. And by the way, I'd like to apologize. I'm afraid I've been pretty beastly. It's a very British thing to say. I've been beastly. (laughs) That's all right, said Edmund. Between ourselves, you haven't been as bad as I was on my first trip to Narnia. You were only an ass, but I was a traitor. Well, don't tell me about it then, said Eustace. But who is Aslan? Do you know him? This is my favorite line. Well, he knows me, said Edmund. He's the great lion, the son of the emperor over sea, who saved me and saved Narnia. We've all seen him. Lucy sees him the most. And it may be Aslan's country that we are sailing to. So I want us to notice two elements here. Did you notice the element of discipline, the claws, the water, the pain, and the element of mission? We are sailing to Aslan's country. We are going somewhere. Guys, this this isn't just fantasy literature for children. These elements are straight out of the Bible. They are part of our relationship with God. 
Let me, let's return back to that passage in Revelation chapter 3, and let's look at the wider context. Context is always vital. You can't cherry pick verses. You've got to look at what's around it. So let me read the verses around Revelation 3, 19 and following. Jesus says, those whom I love, I reproof and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Do a U-turn. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And then here's the new verse. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So do you see the elements here of discipline on the one hand and a destiny to rule and to conquer on the other hand? Those things go together. You can't have one without the other. One of the things Pastor Ray has taught me is you can't just, in your spiritual life, try. You have to train. It's not just about like, oh, I'm trying really hard and I really, really want to. No, you've got to reorganize your whole life and get some dedication into the mix. Get some training into the mix. That is how God, over time, shapes us into the kind of people who can sit on his throne with him. The truth of the matter is, and you learn this the longer you live, pain is a great teacher. There's some things pain can teach us that we cannot learn any other way. Listen to a story uh, from our own church family about a woman whose pain, and not the pain of discipline, more the pain of sorrow, of heartache, was instrumental for her in coming home to Jesus. This is a woman named Amber, and let's watch her story. Although like there was happiness, Inside of me, there was like an emptiness and there was just like this gaping hole um, in my heart and and nothing could fill the void. I grew up in the church. Um, I was four years old when my parents became Christians. Uh, We went to church every Sunday. I was baptized when I was eight years old. Um, I went to private school up until eighth grade. Um, You know, God was all over. When I was about 13 years old, um, my parents started to have you know, problems in their marriage. My dad was struggling with alcohol and um, my mom was just growing very lonely and depressed in the marriage. And so she turned to drugs and, um, you know, after that, our family just fell apart. My parents separated and uh, we lost our family home to foreclosure and um, us, all of us kids were displaced and, and bouncing around between aunts and uncles and grandparents. And it was just chaos. And in that chaos, I grew very angry. Um, I was angry with the Lord. I decided then that that was, I didn't want to have anything to do with him. Um, I just like grew very tired. And I was like, there has to be more. It was in my late twenties, I lost my father and then I lost my grandmother. Those two deaths rocked me and it it took me to like this very dark place. Like that emptiness just like grew bigger and, and louder. I was invited to come to visit a church, uh, which was Calvary Temple Church, and it's now the Bay Church, and it was for my best friend's baptism. At her baptism, at the end of the sermon, the pastor asked, you know, raise your hand if you wanna, if you wanna get to know Jesus. And so I, you know, I raised my hand, and, he, and uh, then he said, you know, go over to the kiosk and someone will pray with you. And so I, uh, I went. And there was a lady over there at, waiting for me, and she said, you know, can I pray with you? Um, and I was like, yeah. And she said, would you like to accept Jesus into your heart today? And I said, no. <laughs> and um, I think she was really surprised by that, but I said, I need to go home and educate myself on this Jesus guy and all this Christianity, and, and maybe I'll be back. She handed me a bag and had like, the New Testament Bible and I went home and I like dove in and I started educating myself Um, and I I was bouncing around from the book of Genesis to the book of Luke and and the more I dove in like the more I just fell in love like I just fell in love with Jesus and um, I could feel like that emptiness and that gaping hole like just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and it didn't take long for me to decide like I wanted Jesus in my life and um, soon after that, like life got better and it didn't get easier. Life didn't get easier. It just got better. And we still were going through the struggles as today. There's still struggles, but 
there's just joy and peace now in these struggles and um, just having this relationship with the Lord and having him, he has my back, he has my front, like, and he's got me covered. Like knowing that just brings me so much comfort. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. I love, I love so many things about her story. By the way, she's a core part of our church leadership team. She's an admin for one of our um, executive pastors, Jason Bishop. So she's, she's uh, fully in. Um, I want to notice a few things about her story. First of all, notice that her coming to faith as an adult didn't involve an, an emotionally charismatic moment at the altar, praying the sinner's prayer or anything. And they asked her, like, hey, do you want to have a relationship with Jesus? She's like, no. I'm going to go home and think about it. Give me a Bible. That's, that's beautiful. And um, as she did, she's reading the Bible on her own. She's studying. Uh, she found herself slowly falling in love with Jesus. It wasn't like a flashbang divine intervention, which can happen. It was a slowly unfolding process, which is every bit as divine. <laughs> and what emerged in that process for Amber are actually the two sorts of knowing that we started out by noticing. She knew more about God. She's reading the Bible. She's, she's gaining head knowledge. And she's coming to know God himself. And we know that the knowledge is, is the real deal. You know why? Because as she was talking about, the inner character of it is love. This is something very important in the Christian faith, and it's a bit of a mystery, but I'm going to put it out there so we can think about it. When we come to know the God who is love, the loving and the knowing kind of blur together into one thing, such that to know God is to love God. To love God is to know God. This is what it means to be a friend of God, to ever be going deeper in knowledge and love, love and knowledge. You're expl it's an exploratory sort of thing. Explore God is not just the title of a sermon series. It's a way of life. It's a mode of lifelong adventure, lifelong discovery. Amber's story points to that. The other thing I love about her story is her, is her blunt honesty that things aren't all magically fixed now. She says life's better, but it's not easier. And man, that's real. You know, when you become a follower of Jesus, yeah, there's an initial moment of decision. You decide, okay, I'm in, first moment. But if you're going to walk with Jesus for the long haul, you know what? You got to make that decision again and again and again. We talk about the idea of converting, which basically means to turn, to do an about face. But you know what? To walk with Jesus for the long haul is to learn the habit of converting afresh every day. That's just the truth. There's always going to be little parts of our life until we're home with Jesus. There's always going to be parts that are raw, that hurt, that are suboptimal, that are temptations, that are slippery like ice. And Christian maturity is about gaining the day-to-day -day habit. It's not heroic on documentaries. It's the quiet day-to-day -day habits of giving those parts of our life to God. That's how we grow. I wish, believe me, I so wish that we could just have a, like a one-off moment of massive spiritual surrender and then, and, then, and then it's smooth sailing forever. You never drift, you never swerve, you never self-destruct, but alas, that ain't reality. We must learn to convert, to turn to Jesus with our whole lives every day. And you know what, when we do that, he's faithful to help us. We're not, we're not on, it on our own. Where we stand from our perspective, things often don't look so good. Both inside us, outside us, we can't see around the corner. Like what happens next? Don't know. But he sees around the corner. And he, not, not only does he infuse hope into our places of confusion and despair, not only does he infuse hope, he himself is hope. Hope in person, hope incarnate. We're never alone when we're with Jesus. And you know what also is so vital, so vital in our, any friendship we're going to have with God is our friendship with each other. 
It's so vital. The Christian life is not meant to be done solo. It's not a sort of Lone Ranger cowboy, Marlboro smoking, like oh, I'm tough, I'll do it on my own. It doesn't work that way. If you try to go on your own, you're going to peel off at some point. Um, the people in this room are God's gift to you. The people who are going to help you and you're going to help them step by step on the rugged, beautiful path of the kingdom, the path to life. Jesus says the path to destruction is easy. Any bonehead can find it. The path to life is, is hard. It's demanding. But it's, it's the way. And we get there together. That's why here in church we've got things like small groups, things like growth track, things like compassion outreaches. Pastor Ray was mentioning uh, men's breakfasts and, and we have women's retreats and all these things. These aren't just like guilty things on your spiritual to-do list that you're like, I guess. These aren't like your spiritual shopping cart, like, ah, no. Like, that's not what these things are. The community of God is Jesus' very body. He lives among us, which means that we experience his strength, his love through each other. This is so vital. We should expect to hear God speaking to us, expect to experience God's love for us through each other. And it's where God makes each of us into lions and lionesses, giving us our assignment that he's going to release us into. So don't deprive yourself of that and don't deprive others of what you have to contribute to their life, what you have to contribute to this community. All right, let's close. I want to come back one last time to the passage in Revelation because I think there's, I think there's a, a twist that we haven't yet seen. Okay, let's read the key verse again. Jesus says, Behold, hey, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I'll eat with him and he with me. My question is, whose house is being knocked on? Whose door is it? That's my question. My first assumption is, oh, it's my door. It's the door of my heart. But Jesus often told stories about a master of a house who went off to a far-off country, and then he returned at an unexpected hour to see if the servants were still awake, to see if they were loyal and on task and ready to welcome him home. Guys, you know what? I think the door Jesus is knocking on, I think the house is his own house. And our job is to welcome him to his rightful home. I think that the meal, he says, I want to eat with you, it's a banquet at his own table. It anticipates the, the banquet at the end of history, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so we're going to close today with sharing a symbolic meal that creates union, communion with each other and with God. When you came in, you received one of these. Would you grab it out, please? Does anybody need one that's missing one? We can, we got someone up here. Just keep your hand up. We'll bring it to you. Got another one right here. Couple up front, guys. One here, one here. Anybody else? Great. You might be saying, Ryan, who is, who, who is communion for? Who gets to do this? This is for the friends of Jesus. This is for the servants of Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to you. If you belong to the body of Jesus, the body and blood of Jesus belong to you. And before we take communion, I'd like today to just make a moment, make space for anybody who might feel that today's your day, actually. You're like, it's, it's actually time for me to open the door to the life, to the world that Jesus has for me. And I've, I've, been, keep, I've been hearing that door knock for a while, and I've been pretending that I'm not home, but today's the day I'm actually opening the door. I'm welcoming him in to, to, to everything of my life. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And as I do, um, 
If today's your day, you just feel it deep in your heart, I invite you to, to agree with me in prayer. Make this your own prayer. Make this the beginning. I'll hold your hand walking through a first dialogue with the risen Lord. Would you close your, head, uh, close your eyes and bow your head? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I don't pretend to fully know you, but I know, I trust that you fully know me. You know everything about me, and you love me. You love me eternally, more than I could ever imagine that I'm loved. And Lord, I want to be your friend. I want to live for something greater than myself. I don't pretend that I'm your equal, but I, I want you to make me fully alive truly human in my time here on this earth and I want to join you in the world to come have mercy on my failings overlook my rebellions teach me Jesus a better way walking with you in your grace every day show me my next steps amen amen if uh I sense that in, in a room like this, I'm sure that there's uh, people who are coming to the Lord for the first time today. If that's you, I want you to know up here uh, after service, come on up. We've got, uh, just like Amber was talking about, we've got a little bag with a Bible in it for you and some other resources that can be helpful for you, okay? So I'll be up here after service, and if that would be um, uh, helpful for you, come and, come and see me. Let's take communion now. Would you take the piece of bread in your hands? Let's pray together. Greater love has no man than the one who lays down his life for his friends. And in our hands, Lord, we hold a symbol of the fact that your friendship for us is so radical that you laid down your very body, your very, your everything for us. So, Lord, we don't take this lightly. We don't take this casually. We receive it for what it is, which is the gift of God's eternal love. And may it not just enter us, Lord, but may it change us. May it strengthen us. May it shape and define our own way of being in the world. No longer a lifestyle of selfishness, but the selflessness that we learn from you. Come into us afresh, Lord, as we eat. Amen. Let's eat together. Let's pray over the cup. Would you take that out, please? Let's pray. Lord, just as we, we talked about today, you are a God who empties yourself. You pour out. And so, Lord, as we take this drink, as it pours into us, may your very love, may your very presence come afresh into our life as individuals, in our inner man, our inner woman, and in our communities, in our families, in our friendships, in our places of work, in our places of recreation, in our vocational dreams. Lord, we welcome you into every corner of our life. Not a dry ritual, but an act of identity of who and whose we are. We thank you. We don't claim to fully understand it but we claim to be fully understood by you, fully loved by you. And with gratitude then, Lord, we drink together. Let's drink. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, it's been awesome to worship with you together today, to study the scriptures. Uh, next week, we're beginning a new Bible series. We're going to study the book of 1 John, uh, which uh, we're pumped about. And uh, Ray, are you preaching next week? Mr. Raymond Menchaca is going to kick that off next week, which is going to be great. Uh, before we go, will you stand? I'd love to leave you with a blessing as we head out. This is from the book of Numbers, chapter 6. 
My friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and in the name of Jesus give you shalom, give you peace. All right, everybody, have a great week. Love you. See you next week.